So what I want to do just to start is motivate um, this kind of current um, project by saying something about what we've done in the past. So in a previous project, Rich and I came together to write a paper on um, animal agency. And I work on animal ethics and Rich works on normative powers, um, like the power of consent um, and the power to promise, that kind of thing. And what we were interested in was a question about um, if animals have a right to self-determination, but yet they lack the capacity to consent, which we think, and Rich is going to explain a bit about that in, in a minute, um, then when, if ever, is it permissible for us to touch them, hold them, bathe them, or confine them, or play with them? So if they're unable to essentially give us normative permission to engage with them in these kind of ways, which would otherwise be rights violating, given that they have a right to self-determination, then, um, yeah, like, how can we engage with them? And I guess that we started um, I, with the intuition that many of these interactions and activities don't look like they're obviously wrongful. So the position that we wanted to develop was one that um, wasn't abolitionist. So we, we thought that, that there is space to have kind of morally um, decent um, interactions between humans and other animals that are respectful of their rights to self-determination, even though they're not able to kind of give us permission in the form of consent, um, and that this would uh, open the door to allowing us to have just interspecies relations with other animals. So in the future, you could have something like um, the Donaldson and Kimlicker view of a just in interspecies society, uh, in which humans and animals live together. So we, we specifically wanted to kind of reject the abolitionist picture, which um, s basically argues that that's not really going to be possible. But importantly, we wanted to take seriously this claim that people like Donaldson and Kimlicker and Ava Mayer and Charlotte Blattner make, which is that animal agency should be taken as kind of normatively significant and indeed for Donaldson and Kimlicker as kind of um, central to the project of interspecies justice. So our position is not merely welfareist, it's not just about um, how animals experience their interactions with us, but rather about their um, agency. And so what we did was we developed an account of how these, how kind of special interspecies relationships which involve um, touching and holding and confining and those kind of things are going to be compatible with the demands of um, justice and in particular animals right to self-determination and so we offer an account of um, animal assent uh, and dissent as a way of um, of kind of getting around this this problem or puzzle as we saw it. So the current project is really about thinking through what the limits of our account are um, and thinking about whether actually assent has the normatively transformative power that we suggested it did <laughs> in the original paper and basically we've come to doubt our ambitious claim um, that it that it in fact could um, at, at least make possible this kind of project of interspecies justice in a way that um, current authors are thinking about it. Um, and so our tentative central thesis for today is that while um, valid assent can make discrete interactions with animals non-wrongful, it cannot legitimise our current practices and maybe even our future practices um, of imposing social roles on animals. So yeah, so basically we just think that this is something that we really massively overlooked in the original in the original paper and now we in this in this paper what we're doing is kind of problematizing the account that we gave so what we're going to do is first rich is going to explain to you briefly um what we said in the original paper so that you um yeah know what's going on and because he's got a better memory than i have um and then we're going to look at the limits of the account through two examples, so companionship and labour, and if we have time we're going to look at two 
objections. Okay, so yeah, I have the fun job of remembering what it is that we said in the paper. Um, that now seems a long time ago, but anyway, here we go. So, so as Angie said, we start in the paper by arguing that non-human animals do sometimes have rights to self-determination. Now, the, the central idea here is that in saying that an agent has a right to self-determination is to say that they have a right that their will is recognized as authoritative within a certain domain of action. So I'm gonna say a bit more about that um, in a minute, but the intuitive idea is that, for example, I have rights to self-determination over my body and so it means that other people can't use or interfere with my body um, against my will, uh, essentially. My will is decisive in, de in determining whether they are able uh, to touch me. Why do we think that uh, non-human animals at least sometimes have rights to self-determination as well as other kinds of rights? Well, um, I mean, the central idea is that like us, non-human animals have significant agential capacities. So they have preferences and goals. They have an understanding of their environment and they navigate their environment in order to satisfy their preferences and goals. And in virtue of having these kind of capacities, which of course vary significantly across um, the animal kingdom, but just take that as read sort of throughout the talk. But in virtue of having these kind of agential capacities, they ground interest in being able to exert control over the contents of one's lived experience. So um, in the paper, we talk about the fact that we think this is for both instrumental and non-instrumental reasons. I'm not gonna get into that now, just sort of in the interest of time, but the, the overarching idea is there's something important for agents or agents of a certain kind of complexity who understand and navigate the world in order to satisfy their, their preferences in being able to exert control over um, their environment and their selves, basically. So this is um, all supposed to motivate the thought that they have these, uh, non-human animals sometimes have these significant interests in having this kind of control. And we say more specifically that these interests are sufficient to ground rights to self-determination when the interests in question um, are sufficient to ground duties in others. So here we're kind of relying on a general interest theory of moral rights. And furthermore, that they're sufficiently competent decision maker within a particular sphere of action or a particular sphere of life um, or regarding a particular interaction. So let me just say a little bit more about this idea of normative authority or the authoritativeness of um, someone's will in relation to a right to self-determination. So what's important here is the idea that when an agent's will is normatively authoritative, the communication of their will is essentially, or normally at least, decisive in determining what other people ought to do. It's not, as we say here, um, it's not the case that the communication of someone's will when it's authoritative is just one further reason to act or not act in a certain way, but rather it's what, um, so we draw on a paper by Daniel Grohl, um, calls structurally decisive. It, it serves to silence or exclude considerations of their good, of their well-being from our practical deliberations. So just to give an example, if I go to the doctors and they propose a course of treatment um, to deal with some uh, problem that I have, but I say no, it's not the case that uh, my saying no mean, is one reason for them not to intervene in a proposed way, which they can then consider alongside the bad effects of the illness on my health or my future possible life, uh, as well as say the bad effects uh, on other members of my family and friends, etc. The fact that I've said no is essentially decisive, um, sort of more or less complicated uh, uh, exceptions aside, it means that they should not intervene, however important it is for my, for my health that they do so. So we think that animals sometimes have these kinds of rights to self-determination, but as I mentioned a minute ago, it's important that they be competent um, or competency is a condition of their having these rights. And an important feature of our account or something that we think at least is, is important is that um, you don't need to think that you can think that 
different animals have these rights in more or less extensive ways or more or less extensive cases. So um, this will vary significantly animal to animal as, as it does uh, in the human case. Um, but in saying that right, animals sometimes have rights to self-determination, we're not necessarily claiming they're always going to be competent decision makers with regard to all things and that we couldn't, for that reason, justifiably intervene, you know, for example, to take them to the vet when they have uh, a horrible gash on their neck, which they don't understand will potentially like be life threatening for them or something along those lines. Um, although it's complicated, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that for present purposes. Okay, so that's a rough account of our argument for this idea that they have rights to self-determination. But then there seems to be a problem. And the problem is that for humans, when they have rights to self-determination, they usually exercise those rights or navigate the fact that they have those rights and that other people have those rights by giving or acquiring consent. And we don't think, or at least I eventually convinced Angie to think that um, non-human animals, at least on certain empirical assumptions, lack the normative power of consent um, as it's normally understood and thought about by, by theorists of consent and, and others, by um, philosophers and legal theorists think, who think about normative powers. Um, so why is that? Well, because to give consent is to intend to give someone permission. It's to, so that it requires having an understanding of the fact that you have rights and that you might waive those rights by communicating someone the intention of waiving um, that right. And so whilst of course it's ultimately an empirical question whether some animals have this kind of understanding in at least some cases, we speculate that most animals won't have the capacities necessary to have um, the, the relevant kind of reflexive intentional thoughts uh, in question. In particular, they won't understand themselves as having rights and others as having duties, which they might waive by expressing some usually conventional token of consent in order to give permission specifically to a certain kind of action, right? So insofar as that's not the case, the sort of puzzle or question emerges if we think that they have rights to self-determination in these cases, but yet they're not able to give us consent to interacting because they're not able to um, exercise the intention of waiving a right as you do when you sign a medical consent form or something along those lines, how can it be, or is it ever permissible to interact with them in these contexts? And our suggestion was that it can still be permissible in some cases. So we can recognize they have these rights to self-determination whilst lacking a power of consent but think it's permissible to interact because they their will can be made manifest through what we called assent and dissent. And in that essence, um, assent is the willful affirmation of some activity and dissent is the willful refusal or rejection of some activity. So if um, an animal um, lies happily while being stroked or seems to be enjoying it or whilst going in the bath, etc., then this is at least plausibly read as an act of willful affirmation, which can make the interaction permissible. Of course, as with consent, the assent in question needs to be sort of voluntary and it needs to involve a sufficient degree of understanding and specifying exactly what those conditions require is, as with consent, kind of complicated, but let's just take those as, uh, as read. And Dissent involves a willful refusal to affirm some interaction. So, for example, running away, hiding, maybe barking angrily, a refusal to go along with something, etc. These could all be signs of dissent. And again, like, you know, reading assent or dissent in any particular context with regard to any particular interaction is going to be difficult and, and it's going to depend upon the context what we think should count. You know, the higher the stakes, the more you're going to need willful affirmation as opposed to, say, like passive acceptance. Um, but all of these things can sort of feature in a full account of when assent and dissent can stand in as the willful affirmation or rejection of, of um, an interaction to potentially make it permissible, compatible with rights to self-determination. OK, good. So that's just a really rough summary of the, 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 the view um, that we're still committed to. Um, so. I think that what we've come to think is that our account was, we were really focused on interpersonal relationships, typically between human and non-human animal companions, 
And also, if we're really upfront about this, we were, had one particular individual in mind, and it was um, essentially a stray cat who had moved in with us. So it was a particular kind of uh, relationship between humans and another animal, where the other animal chose to be with you, and then you had to kind of negotiate um, the terms of that relationship. And so we were thinking um, really in that context. Um, and so we were trying to think through when we were engaging with this cat, um, you know, what can we do with him, to him, like what is kind of permissible and not wrongful. And so this account of valid assent was an attempt to like, yeah, to, to, to kind of capture our intuition that there wasn't anything sort of obviously wrongful about the way that we were interacting with um, him. Um, in, in that case. However, we have now come to worry about the, the narrow focus of the paper and our, our kind of focus on, on that particular case um, and the case of um, interpersonal relationships or interactions within interpersonal relationships. We had a footnote in the paper which was scrapped, but now we've come to think is actually more important. And it touches on something um, that Cedric was just saying in the previous paper. So we had this footnote about um, the possibility of valid um, non-human animal ascent and descent in the context of medical research. And what we suggested was that it might be possible for individual researchers to um, obtain assent from non-human animal participants and obviously to kind of respect their dissent as well. And so we kind of saw this in the previous talk. You can imagine somebody um, anaesthetizing an animal in a way that seems to um, be far more respectful of their agency. Um, and we can imagine different, you know, similar things like taking temperature or, or taking blood samples or whatever it might be. There, there can be varying degrees of respect for the animal's agency. And so what we were thinking at the time was that, yeah, I mean, maybe in those particular instances, there's nothing sort of obviously wrongful about that interaction um, between the researcher and the animal. And it seemed right to think that a researcher who didn't care about the animal's agency and who disregarded their dissent um, would be doing something like morally wrong or morally worse, right? Um, but it was important in this footnote that we said um, that even though it might be possible for a non-human animal to assent to a particular procedure, assent, that assent could not render the research program itself permissible, right? Because the animal in question could not understand or would not be able to understand um, the procedure, uh, the overall program of research that they were a part, right? So they couldn't assent to that. So they might be able to assent to the, the one-off interactions um, and kind of procedures within the overall kind of framework or program of research in which they found themselves, but they couldn't consent to being there in the first, uh, to assent to being there in the first place, sorry. Um, so that was the footnote that was scrapped, but now we've come to think that there might, this might be just a more general problem, that actually when we were, you know, thinking about interpersonal um, human-animal relationships, Actually, maybe something like that is more common, that when we interact with our companion animals, um, those interactions might be non-wrongful because uh, assent is um, sought and given uh, and dissent is respected, but that doesn't tell you anything about the permissibility of the overall relationship, right? It doesn't tell you anything about um, the yeah the relationship the practice or the institution in which the animal and the human uh, interaction is taking place and so what we now think um and what we're going to sort of suggest with these two examples is that actually valid assent to interpersonal um interaction just cannot legitimize the imposition of social roles on animals and the main kind of reason for this um, is because assent does depend on information and competence. And in most of the cases of, of social roles like companionship or labor, which are the two cases that we're gonna discuss, um, 
animals do not have the competence um, in some cases or the information in others um, to to really give assent to to taking on those kind of social roles but we'll say more about that now yeah good so so this is the first time that we've in thinking about this that decided to try and articulate it in terms of social roles so that's a bit of an experiment we'll see how that goes but partly it's because i think that we think it's perhaps a useful way of getting at something which is a dispute between the kind of view that we think we hold um so people and other people who are sort of in this project of thinking that it's really important to respect non-human animal agency to recognize rights to self-determination but are perhaps more optimistic about the kinds of interaction or engagement that we can have with them um, whilst respecting those rights um, so perhaps that will will come out as we go through so a rough characterization of social roles um i've said i mean so in, in some of the sort of sort of human focused literature you you get slightly more narrow definitions you know institutional constellations of rights and duties or something like that that maybe seems unnecessarily narrow um but so i'm saying here or we're saying that social roles involve a pattern of activities behaviors responsibilities and expectations within stable environments on an ongoing basis so just as some general examples you might think of being a housemate or cohabiting with people as being a kind of social role so we might come together because we live in london and it's incre uh, crazily expensive and we need to uh, sh share a house with other people so we might decide you know that we'll each have a room in the house we'll owe our monthly rent um, we'll have to share chores and so on and so forth um, we have an understanding of what's required of us um, of where we'll be uh, of what other people can expect of us and so forth um, perhaps more straightforwardly is the case of occupations. So, for example, UCL uh, offers me a contract to teach, you know, X number of courses for a year and to help out with admin, uh, for which they'll remunerate me a certain amount. Um, that's a, a role that I can kind of sign on to, and I understand the different features uh, of what that role will require of me and what will be required of um, UCL in response with something like this quite rough understanding of social roles um, in the background we want to say that we think generally at least non-human animals can't give assent to fulfill these kind of social social roles social roles that we do often give to them and that's because on the one hand they can't understand the social role and all that it involves so they can't sort of understand the full package of burdens and responsibilities and benefits right they can't understand for example i'll be expected to do this at this time i'll be able to access these spaces i won't be able to access these other spaces i'll have access to certain kinds of food or i'll have to do marking or <laughs> whatever whatever it might be but they don't have that kind of more global or, or more general understanding of the role of the package uh, of burdens and benefits that they might get and moreover, even if they could, um, they can't understand the invitation to take on such a role. Um, it's difficult to think about a framework, at least of interspecies communication, in which they are aware that we are inviting them to take on the role of, say, being our companion or being our labourer in a certain context. And that that will require them to act in certain ways and perhaps receive certain benefits for a, for an ongoing um, period of time. So let's look at these two examples in a little bit more detail. So, for example, if I go to the local shelter, I'm hoping to find a, a new um, companion dog to live with me. When they're when I sort of meet them, they might be happy or they might not. But assuming they're happy uh, and enjoying my company, they don't understand this sort of positive uh, action and activity with me as being anything like assenting to becoming my companion, um, where this involves coming to live in my house uh, with the other people and animals perhaps that live there and then having access to certain foods, being fed at certain times exercising at certain times that fit in with my schedule i mean and all this even if i try to be responsive to their preferences on a day-to-day -day basis so even if i'm kind of consistently going to try and get their assent and respect their dissent to the interactions i have with them 
at the beginning of this process, they didn't understand themselves as assenting to come and live with me um, and to fulfilling that role of my companion. And this is sort of especially important, perhaps, if we think about the importance of agency and self-determination, at least in present conditions, because there's no real opportunity to leave or exit the relationship. There's no real possibility of um, dissenting to being a companion, especially when that relationship well, not especially for either before it's begun and when it's begun. Um, and so it, it seems that like valid assent to the relationship is not really possible. Now, that's not to say necessarily that there's no justification for adopting the dog in the shelter and having them live with you and doing your best to respect their um, agency whilst they do live with you. It's only to say that assent cannot serve as a justification for this kind of interaction, for companionship. And if and so we need another sort of story about um, why it's justified and again why it's justified given rights to self-determination and the importance of agency interests. In the case of companionship, I think unlike the case of labour, which Angie will talk about in just a second, we do think that there is perhaps some possibility for um, a, a more promising alternative um, to the kind of mode or model of companionship that currently exists. So this is BW who, who lived with us for uh, some period of time when we were, lived in Montreal. And the thought roughly though, is that, you know, perhaps non-human animals can choose to live with us for longer or shorter periods. What's important is that in engaging in sort of individual acts of ascent, deciding to come in the house, leave the house, eat food that's presented to them, sleep on the bed, etc. They're at no point sort of choosing to become our companion in the fuller or thicker sense where that means accepting some kind of package of responsibilities and expectations or some significant limitation on their freedom such that, you know, we won't let them go out um, or that we'll move them to a new environment or something along those lines. But they can choose the more everyday interactions of coming into the house and leaving the house and that might mean we spend a lot of time with them uh, and so there's a kind of companionship and a valuable kind of companionship that might arise but it happens in quite a different way importantly though i think we think that in order for the kind of cases of the instances of ascent to do the work or to fully do the work in justifying this kind of model, you would need significant restructuring of the social environment in order to enable the agency of companion animals so that they have more genuine choice about where they are and what they do. So, um, of course, you know, in, in present conditions, it's just not possible for, for many domesticated animals to leave the house or to leave and to go far, to go to other places, to be um, guaranteed security or to guaranteed access to food and shelter etc. I think we think that these things would at least need to change in order to have a model of companionship that's compatible with um, the kind of agency interests uh, of, of animals. Over to you. Okay, so very quickly, um, the second case of animal labour. So what we want to suggest is that non-human animals cannot understand occupational roles that we give to them. Um, and so just to take one example, we think that therapy dogs cannot understand what it means um, to be a therapy dog, right, to take on the role of therapy dog and all that may entail. And this is important because, again, and this is the point that we're trying to stress, um, when they, they don't have a sufficient understanding, right, to be able to give valid assent to being a therapy dog because, Again, they just don't know what that means. And so they wouldn't know, for example, um, that they were going to be required to be on a leash all day or that they were going to be required to be placed in the laps of other people or touched on sensitive parts of their body or that they might be required to not bark and not go to the toilet and not eat anything. Or, in fact, they might be required to bark and be positive and greet um, uh, clients happily, right? So there's a lot of things that, go into um, uh, an occupational role that it seems implausible to us to suggest that an animal could understand um, in advance of taking on that role, um, which would undermine the possibility of them giving um, valid consent to, to such roles. Um, 
here's a bunch of further thoughts on this that are a bit disorganized, but I guess that we also think that occupations um, require training. Um, so whilst it's true that as in the, all of the other cases that we've discussed, that animals might be able to, um, to assent to discrete activities uh, and interactions, they can't assent to the process of being trained for some role. So again, it's this worry about what they would need to know in advance to know that they were okay with being trained to um, perform a certain role. And this um, kind of relates to a further point, which is that the training and conditioning itself we worry um, threatens the possibility of valid, valid assent in the future. Um, and that's because you might be concerned that um, training, um, conditioning and habituation might lead to maladapted preferences where it's not really, um, you know, it's the willful affirmation of the animal to a particular activity or interaction is really a product of the training and conditioning um, that they've been through. Um, rather than what they genuinely want. And I think that Cedric mentioned earlier, uh, one of the chimpanzees who was drawing, right, didn't want to do it, but after a little bit of encouragement, we can get her to do it, and then maybe she's got a preference for it. It's that kind of thing that I guess that we're a little bit worried about in terms of like really fully realising the agency interests of non-human animals. And lastly, um, ascent, valid ascent um, to a role would require um, a genuine uh, exit option and not just an exit, not just the kind of right to dissent to discrete activities and interactions, but to dissent to the whole role. And I think that we worry that actually it's not really possible to give animals um, the, the ability to uh, exit a role because they don't know that they have, they're under such a role, right, that they have such a role. Um, so whilst they might dissent to particular activities um, within that domain, they won't, unless, yeah, they won't be rejecting the whole role. Um, of course, if an animal rejects all of the activities that constitute the role, that will, um, you know, th that will indicate that they don't want to do that particular kind of thing. But it's not them rejecting the role, it's them rejecting each <laughs> yeah, discrete activity or interaction. Okay, so the upshot of all of that, um, and I guess we might have to finish. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the upshot of all of that is that um, ascent can make discrete interactions permissible, but we don't think that it can serve to legitimate the social roles that we um, impose on animals. And the, the imposition of social roles on animals may be permissible, right? So we're not saying that they can't be justified by other means. Um, but what we are saying is that they can't be justified by the appeal to assent. Um, and so when we're thinking about what alternative justifications there might be for imposing these social um, roles on animals, then we think that any alternative story that's given is going to need to be compatible with non-human animals' rights to self-determination. And if it does impinge on those rights, then there needs to be, you know, a, a full justification for um, that kind of infringement. Um, yeah, I should really leave it there yeah, in the interest yeah. of time. So yeah. we didn't get to the objections, but probably we'll have loads, so <laughs> we can talk about them.